This is part of a series of talks on medical innovation in Israel, and our guest is Rami Akalon. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, you're a professor and doctor. You did your PhD in America or here? I did my PhD at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Hadassah Medical School, and I'm a doctor. And then you went to the States for half a dozen years? Yes, six years I spent in the United States and uh, training as a postdoctoral uh, fellow. And then I had a, a non-tenure track position at the Ohio State University. I see. Did they offer you tenure at Hebrew? <laughs> Is that what you um, back? Yeah, I'm on a tenure track. and uh, I, I could have probably tenure also in the States, but I decided to come back. And why? Well, Your you family? know, family reasons. Uh, it's my country. Yeah. I would love to be here. You uh, have four kids, too? I have four kids. Two boys and two girls. Uh, that's terrific. <laughs> it's hard, though, going through research and doing a PhD with young kids. It I was, know I did it myself. <laughs> yeah, it was very hard, but uh, thanks to my wife, uh, she helped me a lot, and we made it. Now, you could have gone to Al-Quds or he Hebrew U. Why did you choose Hebrew U? Well, at the Hebrew University, we have um, a lot of uh, resources, and we have teamwork that uh, could uh, benefit our work and advance our research. Uh, but we're still trying to make some collaborations and networking with uh, other local and non-local universities. Uh, but. Uh, it's, it's not really important where you be, but it's important what you're doing and how you do it. And uh, Well, you need money to do research. I mean, it's yes, uh, especially money, in science. Yes, we need funds. Science. And, uh, and there, a lot. So there's not enough, enough support. Is there some way they can get more support in al Quds? I'm trying to promote <laughs> <laughs> my friends. So uh, I think in the, in the future, things might change, I hope with uh, better infrastructure and better, uh, you know, uh, decisions, political decisions, and hopefully these things will change. Okay. Now, you're moving into the Imrik building here uh, soon. I gather you're in temporary well, quarters, your lab. <laughs> <laughs> it's not sure yet, but uh, we hope to be able to move because we have really some space problems in uh, the current uh, How place. How many people I'm work in your team here? Well, I have eight people. I have uh, one postdoc, three PhDs, uh, and three master's students, and one undergrad. And what's your specific focus of your search to help? Well, our research focuses on the uh, understanding the initiating events of cancer. So we're trying to understand the molecular uh, events and mechanisms that uh, underlie the cancer process. Uh, no, most people know that cancers are just caused by a disease, a cell multiplying un uncontrollably. Right. Cancer is a, a multi-step process. Yeah. It's a genetic disease. Yeah, that's and interesting, because you, you just, as if all cancers are genetic. Yes, when we say genetics, yeah. it means that there are certain genes, cancer genes, what we refer on, that they are altered or affected. And uh, these genes could be uh, tumor suppressor genes that they so you'd suppress okay. the tumor, yeah. or they could be onco uh, genes that they are are activated and they um, promote the tumor growth. I see. So, <coughs> inactivation of tumor suppressor genes and activation of onco genes are uh, one of the hallmarks of cancer. They contribute to the cancer process. And you work on the suppressor side. And I work on the suppressor parts. Why? Is there any reason or just accident of the fate you end no. up with? Well, uh, we get interested in uh, uh, a genomic region uh, in, in, the, in the genome, in the human genome, and it is uh, called fragile site, or common fragile site, just to say that, right? Uh, these are uh, huge genomic regions that uh, are fragile upon uh, exposure to environmental stress. Uh, if these are environmental carcinogens, such as tobacco, or it could be endogenous and from within the cell, like replication stress, when the DNA is replicated. Uh, and these sites are more prone to uh, breaks or forming gaps. Uh, and if a tumor suppressor sits in this region, we might lose this uh, uh, important gene, and the tumor can initiate or can progress. So we get interested in genes that are spanning these fragile sites that are tumor suppressor genes. 
and we try to understand what is the role of these tumor suppressor in the carcinogenesis process. The, the one I read in the few papers of yours I read, and there are always papers of yours. There's six guys write the papers in science, unlike, right. medicine, unlike my field. Uh, and you're often the lead writer in this. So you, it seems to be your territory is this WOX, W-W-O-X. Right. Uh, so WOX uh, is a, a tumor suppressor gene yeah. that uh, spans the second most active common fragile site. It's the second most expressed fragile site in the human genome. It's found very commonly altered in cancer, in almost all type of cancer, whether it is liquid like leukemias, lymphomas, or solid like breast, lung, or prostate cancer. And uh, <clears throat> since it is lost, we thought that it might be, there might be a selection against this gene. And this is why it leads to its uh, deletion and maybe this contributes to the cancer process. So, so I get it, interested in this, in this observation and I wanted to prove whether it works has really a tumor suppressor characteristics. And we started by uh, generating a mouse. This is usually what we use in order to provide an ultimate proof for a tumor suppressor. So if there is a gene that uh, it suppresses tumor and you take it out from the cell or from the organism, you would expect that there will be more tumors. And this is indeed what we did. And we, so we knocked out the gene, we took out, we deleted the gene very in a targeted manner from the mouse. And we monitored these mice and found that uh, these mice developed more tumors compared to the wild type or the litter mates, contro control litter mates mice. Uh, suggesting that indeed Wox is behaving as a tumor suppressor. So this was one aspect. Then we decided to look into uh, how Wox is developing. What is the mechanism that uh, leads to tumor formation? And um, we, we initiated a, a lot of biochemical studies in order to understand the network of uh, the Wox gene. What does it interact with and what does it lead to? Uh, and we come, we came across very interesting observations. But when I read in one of your papers, for instance, of breast cancer, that you found that uh, uh, Wax, this Wax uh, element was missing in 36 percent of, uh, well, if I remember the figure correct, is that the correct one? Yeah. Well, we find Wax altered in breast cancer in, amount, in about 50 percent of oh, the 50%, cases. 50 percent, not 36 percent. So whether it is totally lost, oh, I like see. in 36 percent, oh, totally. or it is. 14% where you see it reduced. I see. And the reduced level of Vox also represent a, a, stat, a state of uh, inactivation because you have only one allele instead of two alleles. The gene has usually, it, it, it's expressed in two alleles. And in this case, we most likely have one allele or the, uh, the amount of the total protein is reduced. Okay. So you have this and you discover that this is a suppressor gene is missing in part or whole. Right. And when you get that, you get a incidence of cancer. It's not the only thing because there could be obviously breast cancer from other sources. Absolutely. But this is very important if it's in 50% of the cases. Right. And it is, it's also important because we saw that when Wox is absence, this is a bad prognosis for breast cancer women. I mean, it correlates or it associates with worse survival of breast cancer. Can you actually do tests and say Wax is missing in yeah. a person? This is what we did in one of our papers that we published in Cancer Research in 2007. And we showed that actually Wax associate with, or the Wax intensity or Wax levels associates with survival. The more patients have Wax in their cells, they have better survival compared to those patients that lost Wax uh, expression. <coughs> but, but if beforehand, if you find there's a low element, you can anticipate they're likely to have cancer, even if they don't have yet cancer. Right. So we, we indeed discussed this possibility of using Wax as a diagnostic tool. I see. So, so because let's continue that. Right. So I want to take a break, and we're going to come back to that. <coughs> in diagnosis and then we'll go into cures, okay? okay.